Hey guys, welcome. Uh, we had a good break. Let me uh, share my screen again. Great. Okay. Cool. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Uh, so now we are towards the end of uh, the first chapter, basically, really, uh, of worship ministry in the Bible. Okay. And the last chapter, the last section is all about the David's tabernacle. Um, so in this whole section, to uh, you know, in this whole chapter, what we've really covered is worship ministry in the Bible, how the patriarchs like Abraham worshipped, um, you know, how uh, how the worship ministry was organized in the Old Testament, uh, you know, in, in, in the tabernacle of Moses, uh, and just a little bit about the tabernacle of David, and how worship ministry was organized in the New Testament, how it was encouraged and followed and practiced in the New Testament. Right. And um, the last section was all about going through the tabernacle of Moses in more in just a little bit more detail for us to understand uh, how worship ministry was organized, that people just couldn't go and do whatever they felt like doing in the name of worshiping God. Um, there was a structure, there was a procedure, there was a method, uh, there was a process set in place, right? Because our God is a God of process. Our God is a God of structure. He's a God of details. Um, and that's something that we learned uh, in, in the tab from the tabernacle of Moses. And there's so much that we can take away from that, right? Uh, um, so now we step into uh, another very popular and a well-known uh, name in uh, in the world of worship, at least, uh, is David, right? And, uh, and his tabernacle, the tabernacle of David. So that's what we're going to learn. We are in page 22. Uh, so let's get started. So the tabernacle of David simply talks about the Davidic order of worship, how he organized worship in his tabernacle. Okay. Um, so let's just uh, get a, a brief background of how David, even before David went and erected, uh, uh, you know, his tabernacle, what exactly happened? What, you know, what was, what was happening, right? Um, so we all know this, the Israelites continued in the years that followed Moses's time with the tabernacle worship that Moses instituted as instructed by God with the priests preparing and offering sacrifices in the prescribed manner, okay? For a, a long time, for years, um, Israelites followed the way Moses had instituted, right? Because that's how God commanded. Now, fast forward, okay? You finish the book of Deuteronomy, you have Joshua and Judges, and then you get the book of First Samuel, right? You have the book of Joshua, you have the book of Judges and First Samuel, right? Now, in First Samuel, we read about uh, you know, Eli the priest, we know about it, right? Uh, priest of the tabernacle, uh, where he had two sons. They were uh, living an immoral life. Uh, you know, they were they were stealing from people. They were sleeping with the women who came to the temple. Uh, they was just they were just living a very uh, Im, uh, uh, not not a right li life. And God was very disappointed uh, with them about that, right? But at the same time, you know, during the time, if you read First Samuel uh, chapter 4, uh, Philistines was also attacking the people of Israel. Now, if you read the history, okay, when, whenever you can, uh, in, in the book of Exodus and, and all, every time Israel went for battle, right, every time they went for war, the priests would carry the Ark of the Covenant in the front of the army and go before the army, right? And we'll see that in Second Chronicles chapter 20 as well. Every time they had to fight a battle, the priests would carry the Ark of the Covenant and go in front of them, knowing that the you know it was a symbol where God is going before us. His presence is with us. That is a history. Okay, but here the sons of Eli uh, have been living an immoral life and there doesn't really seem to be a people or a generation of people where they are fearing God. So in a time like this, 
the Philistines are attacking Israel and Israel also goes to war with the Philistines. So that's the context here and see what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 4 onwards. Uh, you know, at the, uh, before this verse is uh, from verse 3, verse 2, when you read, it says that Israel uh, were losing. They didn't know what to do. So they get this bright idea. They're like, hey, in, in, in the past, in the history, you know, when every time they went for war, when they were losing, Israelites were losing the war, they went and got the Ark of the Covenant. So let's do this. Okay. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts who dwells between the cherubim and the two sons of Eli, whose names were Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. So the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated. See that? What, what did they miss? What, did, what, what went wrong? The Philistines fought. Israel was defeated. But they took the Ark of the Covenant and went. They thought that they could win the battle without any intimacy with God. They could just use him for their sake. Are you guys with me? Uh, one of my friends, uh, you know, who's uh, an evangelist, uh, he made this statement that will remain with me for the rest of my life. Okay, uh, he said, uh, you know, when he was preaching, he said, um, "With intimacy, God will use you, and without intimacy with Him, you will be using God." Okay, can I say that again? Like, with intimacy. With intimate relationship with God, He will use you. And without intimacy, you will be using God. And uh, and so many times, uh, you know, like in my own life, I don't want to take an example of anybody else, but in my own life, there's been times where I have not had an intimate relationship with God during that week. And uh, I will go ahead, I will have to go and lead worship somewhere. Uh, but God will sh still show up. Now, God, will sh God showed up because he is good and he loves his people. Okay. He showed up not because I had an intimate relationship with him in that week, but he is, he showed up because he is good. What was I doing? I was using him. And it's not really nice, is it? But with intimacy, he will use you. God will use you. But so that's what's happening here in First Samuel 4 as a background to understanding the tabernacle of David is from the time of Moses, uh, you know, we see Eli was the high priest of the tabernacle whose son, uh, his sons were, uh, were not right, living a righteous life. But they were not living a righteous life. And when they went into battle, they thought they could use God's presence to win the battle without their, uh, without intimate relationship. They lost and see the, and see how they lost. Every man fled. There was a very great slaughter. A very great slaughter. And there fell Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. How many? 30,000 foot soldiers died. And here's the thing. The ark of God was captured. And the two sons of um, Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Now that's a, one of the very uh, a sad chapters in the Bible, in 1 Samuel chapter 4. And I would encourage you to read them, okay, when you can. So what happened there is that the Philistines captured the ark of the covenant. Okay, um, now what they do, it, it gets interesting. Let's see. The Ark of the Covenant was taken by Philistines and kept in their temple. Okay, in their temple with idols. The next day, the, they found an idol fallen and broken and the Philistines experienced the wrath of God. And so they were like, you know, our God, our idol has fallen his head is broken, okay? The name of their God was Dagon. 
Okay, it's actually there in. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you'll know this. And in First Samuel chapter five, when you read, uh, you'll know that uh, they called their idol their god Dagon, and they had, he had fallen before the ark, and his head was broken, and they experienced the wrath of God. And Philistines were like, you know what? We don't want to keep this with us. We do not want this with us. We don't want the ark. Okay, we. Uh, you know, we, we took it ignorantly, but please take it away. So they sent the ark away, okay? Uh, and they tried moving the ark from city to city for seven months and finally decided to return it to the Israelites because they could not bear the wrath of God anymore. Okay? Now, what happened after that? The ark was returned to Israel but they did not know how to handle the ark in the proper manner. Okay, how to handle the ark in the proper manner. First Samuel 6, 19, uh, we can read about it. So it was left in the house of a man named Abinadab in a place called Kirjath Jerim. Okay, it's very important for us to know all these guys. Okay, remember, it was left in the house of a man named Abinadab in a place of Kirjath Jerim. Now, it was in his house, it was in that place for almost how many years? 70 years. Okay, 70 years. Um, but while the ark was not in the temple, okay, another interesting thing that was happening is during this time, the tabernacle worship continued in Israel. Okay, the tabernacle worship continued, but Ichabod, Ichabod is the word that was used there. It simply means that the glory of the Lord had departed. Okay, the glory of the Lord had been departed. That's the meaning of the word Ichabod. Now, for almost 70 years, the people there worshipped, I don't know what, in the tabernacle, but the presence of God was not there. Now, is it something that we should think about, guys? We can have all these um, worship concerts and, and perform all, do all the ministry work that we want to do. But if the king of the house, if the God of the house is not there, what is the point, right? And that's exactly, you know, seems to be happening here is that the worship went on in Israel in the tabernacle, uh, you know, all the ritualistic practices without the presence of God. And for almost 70 years, when David was made king, he brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Right? He pitched a big tent and placed the Ark and established worship, which included singing and music. Okay, so after 70 long years, David, David makes, uh, has, is now been made king. And, um, you know, he brings back the Ark of the Covenant. And he's like, you know, I'm not going to rest until I bring back the presence of God. Amen. So that is the backstory. That is, uh, you know, uh, yeah, uh, is just a background for us to understand, uh, you know, the Ark of the Covenant and how David brings it into the scene. Okay. Now, uh, one of the important things, and I want to do this very quickly. Okay. So I want us to be a little fast. Okay. Let's go to, uh, hey, guys, I want to apologize if you can hear someone honking. Um, I'm sorry, my it's beyond my control. And, uh, someone is being a very uh, obnoxious outside. <laughs> uh, if you can't hear it, good, 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 all good. Okay. Um. So let's okay. Let's just go to Second uh, Samuel chapter six. Fast, fast. Okay. Before we continue in your notes here, let's go to Second Samuel chapter six. There's a very important lesson that uh, it's uh, that we need to learn here. Okay. Second Samuel chapter six. This is a chapter where it talks about, uh, you know, David bringing the ark back. Um, 
Okay, I'm, I'm going to read it for us. Chap, uh, chapter 6, verse 1. Second Samuel, chapter 6, verse 1 onwards. It says, David again brought together out the Israel a chosen men, 30,000 in all. He and all his men set out from Bala of Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God. Remember, see the number, even 30,000 in all. And it was 30,000 men who had died on, on the day of the battle when they lost the Ark, when the Ark was taken. Now, again, David seems to like, know about this somehow. It's like 30,000 people died that day. I'm going to take 30,000 men and go and bring the Ark back. Okay. Uh, verse 2, uh, he and all his men set out from Bala of Judah to bring back from the Ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim that are on the Ark. Verse 3, they set the Ark of God on a new cart. Okay, underline that if you haven't in your Bible. They set the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab which was on a hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the Ark of God on it. And Ahio was walking in front of it. David and the whole house of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with songs, with harps and lyres, tambourines, sistrums and cymbals. Okay, full celebration. Full party is going on. Verse 6. When they came to the threshing floor of, of Nakun, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. Uh, verse 8. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, the place is called Perez Uzzah. Okay, there's a footnote down there. Um, where is it? J, 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 J. Okay, which means uh, outbreak against Uzzah. Okay. Um, key things. Verse 3. They first of all put the Ark of God on a cart. Okay, on a on an animal cart, buffalo cart, something, oxen cart. Now, now David is king. He is made king. And one of the first thing that he does is he wants to bring the ark back. And we see that there's a celebration happening. There's everything is going right and whatnot. But there's something that God tells almost 400 years ago. Okay, let's quickly go to Deuteronomy chapter 17 almost 400 450 years uh, you know god tells something very interesting deuteronomy chapter 17 are you guys with me give me a yes if you're with me yes okay okay awesome Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 17. I'm going to read from verse 14. Okay, I'm going to read from verse 14. Here we go. When you enter the land, the Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settled in it. And you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. Now, guys, remember, this is almost 400 years. Okay, no, I'm saying 400 years before when? 400 years in uh, when you come down to the first Samuel, where people ask, we need a king like other nations. And Saul is their first king. Okay, so the timeline between this and that, between Deuteronomy, this chapter, and then is almost 400 years. That's what the historians claim, more or less. Okay. And here God is saying, when you enter the when you enter the land, the Lord your God is giving you. It's like God already knew. I mean, it's not a surprise that God knew, obviously, because He's God. And He says He knows it all. 
uh, he says in in verse 14 let us set a king over us all the like all the nations around us verse 15 be sure to appoint over you the king the lord your god chooses he must be from among your own brothers do not place a foreigner over you one who is not a brother israelite verse 16 the king moreover must not acquire great number of horses for himself or make the people return to egypt to get more for more of them for the lord has told you you are not to go back to that way again he must not take many wives verse 17 who who's the he the king must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray he must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold verse 18 when he takes the throne of his kingdom he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law okay guys pay attention it's very important verse 18 when he when he becomes the king when he takes the throne he is to write the king is to write for himself on a scroll on a paper a copy of the law what is the law the word of god taken from that of the priests who are levites verse 19 it is to be with him and he is to read it all the days of his life he is to read what he is to read the word of god all the days of his life that he may learn to revere the lord his god and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees and not consider himself better than his brothers and turn from the law to the right or to the left okay let's stop there now david was very passionate uh, and very enthusiastic about bringing the ark of the covenant back when he made king right uh, and he because he was a worshipper but if he had done what this verse says right in first in deuteronomy chapter 17 verse 18 and 19 it says when a person becomes a king he is supposed to write the word of god he is supposed to read it day and night uh, around the priests he is supposed to make a copy of it now something tells me that david did not do that which is why he put the ark of the covenant on a cart had he read the word of god and the law he would know that the ark of the covenant was to be carried by priests only by levitical priests only right um so here's the thing a point there why i wanted to kind of enlight uh, or share this is um it's not enough you know as being passionate about worship you know and if it's almost seems like today's generation you know we say like oh i love worship i love worship i love worship i love worship i'm passionate about worship uh, and what not um which is all fine is all good uh, but you cannot ignore the word of god isn't it and had david as king uh, you know as enthusiastic as he was um, you know had he read had he, you know uh, read in the law the word Uzzah's life would have been spared, isn't it? Uh, he would not necessarily have uh, died. So, it's very important that we always learn and read from the Word of God. Uh, and okay, you guys with me so far? A- a- any thoughts? Yes, any sir. questions? Okay. Cool. Um, but one of the most beautiful things about david right in uh, we we read in uh, first samuel second samuel chapter 6 verse 8 it says david was angry with god about uh, about you know uza dying but he just doesn't remain angry the beauty of david is that he repents he goes back he comes to the word of god he learns okay you know i made a mistake i did not know it the ark of god was to be carried by the by the levites then he comes back with levites and then he brings the ark of the covenant okay and that's what we see here uh, we see how he goes about erecting 
the tabernacle, how he learned from his mistake. Okay, uh, David's tabernacle is just a beautiful thing about how David, one person, learned from his mistake, which could have been avoided. Yeah, sure, we all make mistakes, but David, you know, learns from his mistake and see how he goes about erecting it. Yeah, so point one, David set the ark in a tent, the tabernacle in Jerusalem he had raised for it. He then blessed the people and celebrated. Uh, First Chronicles 16, verse 1 to 3, it says, So they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. He blessed the people in the name of the Lord. Then he distributed to everyone of Israel, both man and woman, to everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, a cake of raisins. So as soon as he brings it back, he sets it up in the tabernacle. Um, he throws a party to the people of uh, Israel. He provides bread and meat and cake of raisins for, to everybody. Um, that's one of the first things that he does. And then we go on to see David appointed Levites to minister to God by remembering, thanking, and praising um, you know, in First Chronicles chapter, chapter 16, verse 4, it says, He appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord, to commemorate. That means to remember, to thank, and to praise the Lord. Okay? As soon as he's done throwing a party, uh, here from verse 1 to 3, next thing that he does, he appoints, administers, he delegates. He's like, okay, you, 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 you. Okay, he appoints ministers uh, to minister to whom? To God, uh, you know, to give him thanks, to give him praise, uh, to give him glory, to exalt his name. Amen. Um, and David wrote a bunch of Psalms to dedicate the ark being established in Jerusalem. Uh, these are all the scriptures for, uh, you know, for you to refer to and read to at a later point. Um, let's come down. Missing something. Okay. Right. Um, then continues to say that in same First Chronicles chapter sixteen, verse thirty-seven, thirty-eight. Uh, he says, he, so he left Asaph and his brothers there to minister before the ark regularly, as every day's work required. And Obed Edom with his 68 brethren to be gatekeepers. Okay. Uh, David left the Levites to minister to the Lord before the ark as their full time occupation. Uh, this has never been done before, you know, to, to, to minister before him as full time 24 hours, seven days a week, through the, through the week, through the, around the clock. Uh, David is administering that in his tabernacle. Okay, uh, now let's read a couple of scriptures. Once again, I'm going to ask you to read. Uh, everybody, let's turn to uh, First Chronicles chapter 9, verse 33. Okay, one of us keep First Chronicles chapter 9, verse 33, ready. The other person, 16, 37. And the other person, 23, 5. Okay. Can someone help me with reading that, please? Uh, chapter 9, verse 33. Those who were musicians, heads of Levite families, stayed in the room of the temple and were ex, ex uh, how, how do you read that? Exempt from other duties because they were responsible for the work of work day and night. Okay. Thank you for that. So exempted means that they were excused from doing other work because uh, you know they were, uh, they were their only task was to uh, minister unto the Lord. Okay, that's what it says. Nine thirty three says those who were musicians, heads of Levite families, stayed in the rooms of the temple 
and were exempted from other duties. They were excused from other duties. Their only duty was as musicians uh, to be present in the, house, in, in the tabernacle, in the, in the house of God and minister unto him day and night. That's what it says, right? They were responsible for that work day and night. Uh, that's wonderful, isn't it? Um, so let's read uh, 1637. King David put Asep and his fellow Levites in permanent charge of the worship was hill at the place where the covenant box was kept. They were to perform the duties there day by day. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Can I request someone to read uh, 23 verse 5, please? Another 4,000 will work as get the keeper and 4,000 will praise the Lord with the musical instrument I have made. Thank you, uh, Kiran. Kiran, can I ask you to read uh, from verse 1 to uh, verse 5, please, if you don't mind? Yes, sir. When David was an old man, he appointed his son Solomon to be king over Israel. Second, David summoned all the leaders of Israel together with the priests and Levites. All the Levites who were 30 years old or older were counted. And the total came to 38,000. Then David said, from all the Levites, uh, 24,000 will supervise the work at the temple of the Lord. Another 6,000 will serve as official and judges. Another 4,000 will work as getter keepers. And 4,000 will praise the Lord with the musical instrument I have made. Did, did you all pay attention to those numbers? <laughs> did you guys pay attention to those numbers? 38,000, okay, in verse 3. 24,000, it says in verse 4. 24,000 are to supervise the work of the temple of the Lord. Yeah, I'm just letting it sink in, you know. Um, 24,000 to supervise the work of the temple of the Lord and 6,000 are to be officials and judges. 4,000 to be gatekeepers. 4,000 gatekeepers, guys. And 4,000 are to praise the Lord with musical instruments. Okay, 4,000 are to Praise God with musical instruments. I have provided for that purpose. He's saying, I have made. David is saying, I have made musical instruments for that very purpose. He said, you guys would praise him. Oh, man. And then verse 6. David divided the Levites into the groups corresponding to the sons of Levi. Okay. Levi had three sons. Okay. Levi is the third son uh, of Jacob, right? And so Levi had three sons, and that is Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. Okay, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. These were the three different clans of the same tribe. Okay, um, we're not going to go into the details of all of that, but uh, but I mean that that number is just uh, is, is mind boggling. Okay, to imagine uh, how many people were involved in the tabernacle of God. And David's tabernacle that he erected, right? Um, so let's go on to see that in point seven here, the work was regular. It was consistent. Uh, it had requirements, uh, the duties with standards, as they were freed from other duties and employed in the work of day and night worship. Okay, day and night worship. In Second Chronicles eight fourteen, it says here. And according to the order of David, his father, he appointed Levites for their duties to praise and serve before priests. Right. Um, and we see that in, in David's tabernacle, it was so beautifully organized and that system was followed for ages to come. 
And then we see that in the book of Acts, chapter 15, verse 13 and 18, okay, uh, Apostle James, he quotes from the prophecy of Amos, where Amos in chapter 9, verse 11 and 12, okay, chapter 9, verse 11 and 12, it says, on the last days, this is what it says, right? And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out them a people for his name. And with this, the word of the prophets uh, agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up. And so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Okay, so, and, and now we see that during this day and age, at this time, that God is rebuilding the tabernacle of David. We see movements uh, around the world where they are setting up house of prayer. Uh, you know, uh, one of the example is uh, uh, IHOP, uh, which is known as the International House of Prayer. It's one of the movements that has 24 bar 7, 365 days right through the year, non-stop praise, worship, and prayer, day and night, without break. That's just one of the movements. That's, that's, I, that's one of the things that I can remember, okay? That's I hope. There's so many other, uh, you know, movements that God is raising up these, this day, in this day and age, where it's a sign of him rebuilding the tabernacle of David. A tabernacle of David was so prophetic in nature. Okay. Why am I saying this? The tabernacle of David did not have outer courts, inner courts, and the most holy place. It was it, it, it was just the tabernacle in the middle, the Ark of the Covenant in the middle. And everything was open. It was like a prophetic in nature in a sense that every man could come. So again, something about David. We talk about David as a warrior. We talk about David as a shepherd. We talk about David as a worshiper. But we don't really, uh, you know, give credit to the prophetic on David. And if you read Psalm 22, you see David was incredibly prophetic. It's about, you know, Psalm 22 is all about Jesus' crucifixion. And David writes about it. And he must have shared such an intimate relationship with God that he saw that the greatest commandment was the commandment of love. The greatest law was love. And so David, in his life, he did not live from present to the future. Okay, David lived from the future in the present. He saw, okay, it's, this is going to be the new covenant. This is the new covenant. This is the love of God. This is the blood of Jesus that makes his presence available for all people. So he seems to have believed that. And this, and so his tabernacle had no outer courts, no inner courts, nothing. It was just the Ark of the Covenant in the middle. And everybody surrounded it in a tent. <clears throat> Isn't that wonderful? Right? Uh, are you guys with me? I, 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 I all tired. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so let's move on to the next section and we'll see how did, what are some of the lessons that we can learn from David's worship team and how he went about organizing it. Okay, and how we can use it uh, for our worship ministry in ministry in general. Okay, uh, we are in page 25 um, of the notes. <clears throat> so this section is the lessons from David worship team. It's like, uh, let's go to First Chronicles 25. First Chronicles chapter 25. Okay. 
Okay. It says, David, together with commanders of the army, set apart. That's the first thing that we need to underline in your Bible and learn. Okay. David, what did he do? He set apart. Okay, uh, set apart is simply means holy unto the Lord. The root meaning of the word holy means set apart, to be cut off. Okay, to be cut off. When we say, Lord, you are holy, we are telling that God is set apart, that there is no one like him, that there is just no one, no comparison. No pointing finger and saying, okay, God is like this angel. God is like that. No. He is just God all by himself. And one of the first things that David does is he sets apart people. It's like, hey, you are holy unto the Lord. Okay, what, what you are going to be doing, you don't have to keep doing other stuff. You are exempted. Like right, that scripture we read, they were exempted from all other duties. Their only duties, they were set apart and to worship and ministry unto the Lord. Okay, and we need to know that, guys. As we need to understand the seriousness of being set apart and being holy. Okay, in Deuteronomy 12, 9, 29, 31, it says, God says, <clears throat> don't compromise and follow into the worship practices of the Canaanites. Don't go and worship their idols. Don't offer sacrifices to their gods. Don't flirt with the world. Okay, don't have this chalta hai attitude. Ah, it's okay. It's just this, no problem. You know, it's not a sin, etc., etc. Are you guys with me? Okay, being set apart is very serious. Okay. Um, because God is a very jealous lover. He does not tolerate, uh, you know, having a rival throne in, the, in our hearts. For him. In, in Zechariah, right, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 20 and 21, we see that all those, um, all the vessels that was used in the tabernacle, right, uh, every cup, every plate, it would have this inscription that says, holiness unto the Lord. That's powerful. Every vessel, every utensil that was used in the tabernacle had that inscription, holiness unto the Lord. And there would, there would, there would be this huge uh, cap or turban kind of a thing that a high priest would wear, right? The high priest. And right on top in gold, it would be written, holy unto the Lord. That simply means to say that I am set apart. Unto the Lord, all right? In Second Peter, Peter says that we are now a royal priesthood. Okay, everybody say priesthood with your mics muted. Okay, that means just as those priests wore that thing that said holy unto the Lord, we are now royal priests that we called to be set apart. Amen? So that's the first thing, okay? Um, Whole, you do not become holy by wearing white shirt, white pant. Uh, it's not a cosmetic thing. You don't become holy if your beard is clean. Shaved. You don't just become holy if you don't wear jewelry, um, etc. Okay, we have made uh, that holiness as a cosmetic thing. Okay, if you do all these things, if you wear this thing, if you sit properly, if you do the right thing, you are holy. Uh -uh. Holiness is a is a fruit of communion with the Lord. Again, it goes back to intimacy. Holiness is a result of your communion with God, your intimate relationship with Him. His holiness rubs off on you. Uh, what is important for us to know is that our teams, our people, we are called to be set apart. Okay, that's the first lesson. Second thing we see is the David set apart some of the sons of Asaph, Heman, and Jerthan for ministry of prophesying, right? Ministry. Uh, ministry simply means to serve, okay? Love plus service is ministry. We see that in John 13, uh, that when Jesus washes the feet of his disciples. That is ministry. 
uh, you know, another title that comes with ministry is minister. I'm a minister of God. We have, you know, chief minister, finance minister, um, the defense minister, whatnot. But we think as soon as this title gets added to our name, I'm a minister, um, we are entitled for everything. I don't have to serve, you know, everything has to come to me. Uh, other people should come and serve me, if uh, you know, etc., etc. But ministry simply means, it actually literally uh, in the Hebrew root word means a cup bearer. Okay, you're a cup bearer, you come, you, it's like a waiter, you are serving. Okay, and so in ministry, we are required to uh, have a ministry attitude, a servant's at attitude. That's the second lesson that we learn. And the third thing, what we learn is uh, in verse 2, 3, and 6 of the same chapter, 1 Chronicles 25. Okay, it says, all the sons of Asaph, all the sons of Jeruthun, okay, all the sons of Heman, they were all... And in verse 6, when you come down to verse 6, it says, all these men were under the supervision of their fathers. Okay? Under the supervision of their fathers. And all their fathers were under the supervision of the king. At the end of it, you see, all of them were under the supervision of the king. Now, for you to be under a supervision, that simply means submission. Another is another word for that. You need to submit yourself to the leadership. Submission is another sign of humility. I'm willing to be under your submission. I'm willing to be under the submission of my senior pastor, right? Um, because the first worship leader, the devil, he had serious issue with submission. And you can read in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, it's like, uh, I will become like the most high. I will ascend above, I will ascend my throne above the throne of God. He did not want to be submissive and pride hit him. And what happened, we all know um, that he had, there was a fall. And, you know, in James chapter four, verse six says, God resists the proud. Here's the thing, guys. In, uh, in Philippians chapter 2, we see how Jesus humbled himself, right? The source, the origin of humility is Jesus. And the origin of pride is devil. Are you guys with me? The origin of humility is Jesus. And the origin of pride is the devil. And James 4, 6 says, God resists the proud. And as a worship leader, as a worshiper, um, the last thing that I want is God resisting my worship. When I go before him in singing, when I go before him in worship, I don't want God to tell, ah, Roshan, stay away. I, I, you know, I don't want your worship because it is not true. Your heart is filled with pride. Who wants that? Right. So uh, third lesson, third point there for all of us to learn is that we have to learn to be submissive, uh, you know, humble, to humble ourselves. Like Jesus says, not my will, but let your will be done. That's a sign of humility. Right. Are you with me? And, um, and just the last two points here in verse six, seven and eight. It says every name that is mentioned, right? Every name that is mentioned in the chapter, it says, all of them were trained and skilled. They were the best in what they did. They were amazing at what they did. They were very skillful at what they did. And, and God is calling us, you know, be skillful in what you do. Whatever it is you do, graphic designing, dancing, uh, you know, singing, uh, preaching, teaching, Whatever it is you do for him, do it skillfully because these men were skilled. They were trained. Invest in yourself, you know, where you can get trained in your art, in your craft. Uh, that's another lesson. And finally, we see that in verse 8, can we look at verse 8 uh, in First Chronicles 25? It says, young and old alike, 
teacher as well as students cast lots for their duties. One of the important things that we learned uh, and the last thing that we need to learn and uh, I'll pause here is that in David's worship team, one of the last lessons is that there was space for young people. There was a space for old elderly generation as well. Right? You cannot, you cannot have a team that says, I will have only the youth in my team and not old. And you also cannot say, I will only have the older folks and not the youth because the youth are rebellious. They don't know what they do. No. In David's worship team, we see that they were young and old, teacher and student. Right? There was un unity in his worship team. So first thing, they were set apart unto ministry that they need to learn to serve. They were under the supervision. They were submissive. They were trained and skilled. And they were all teachable. Amen? Uh, just one minute over time. And uh, I hope you get something out of it. And uh, we'll resume uh, some of the sessions next week. Okay, guys? Because you have to go into the other class, I'm going to stop the session now. Um, and stop the recording.